You know, as I look back on um, my life, I think back to uh, my college days. And, you know, most people, when they get, start going to college, they get internships working for, you know, IBM or General Motors or Ford or Chrysler, some company like that. I was thinking that when I maybe do my next book, I was going to call it the internship. Because it, it brings back some memories of at the time my father got out of prison following the, following the um, case with him and Eddie was in 84, which was at the exact time that I was starting college at um, WMU University. And over the next couple years, between what would be 84 and 88, you know, my internship was kind of in how the world of international finance and international criminal activities overlap. And I remember seeing, um, my father once sent me to see some guys in, in New York, uh, some banking guys. And, they were like on 6th Avenue, right in the middle of Midtown Manhattan, and it's got these fancy offices and pretty secretaries and a stock market machine, printing out stock market quotes. And it looked like a legitimate brokerage firm. But you know, the real deal is when you go in the back, it's just a couple of old white guys sitting around a desk with a whole bunch of people bringing them money in. And what they were doing were, they were money launderers. They were people that you could bring $200,000 of singles and $5 bills and then they'd end up writing you a check from some company and for 10% of what the cash value was, boom. And it's funny because at the same time I'm going to class and I'm taking economics and business 101 and marketing. And you know, your economic teacher's telling you about a business plan and how you get a small business loan. And you know, it's, it's kind of the hypocrisy of the world because I'm like, that ain't how the real world works. You know? I, the people in, in corporate America, the difference between corporate America and the narcotics world, that line is so much thinner than people really, really know. You know, the thing is, they call a party store who sells marijuana a front. But, you know, it's just they don't know that some of the real fronts are the places that you call banks or, or uh, currency exchange or, you know, uh, international finance. You know, that was kind of part of like my internship or um, uh, some other associates that I met later on in life, I guess this would be called my graduate, graduate work. S Lower Manhattan, right in the fabric textile area. And I, I meet a guy and there's some people from Israel, there's some people from South America, and there's some people from West Africa, and then it's myself. And we were all taking advantage of the services that these people in Lower Manhattan did. Now, if you walk by it, you would just think this is one of the numerous premier uh, textile factories in New York. But once again, what these people did were they took money from here, from point A, they got it to point B, and when it comes back to point C, it looks like a legitimate transaction. So um, you know, life's interesting. There's a lot of different forms and ways to get an education. And uh, sometimes it can get a little tricky. You know, I remember uh, one time on my way uh, down to the islands, and um, of course, my name is Courtney Brown Jr. Well, unfortunately, I didn't put Junior on my reservations, so it tell just it, said. Tell it in the way, tell it in that, that, that you're running late. Yeah, you know, and, and sometimes, again, doing like any intern, sometimes interns do things sloppy because they're not a professional. So one time I was getting sent down to the islands to, um, to pay a bill. For, uh, for my old man, and uh, I'm running late. Our people get to pick me up uh, from the west side of Detroit. They half drinking, half partying, getting high and shit. And anyway, we get to the airport. We do everything you ain't supposed to do. I buy a one-way ticket cash from Detroit to Miami, from Miami to the islands, which is a red flag for anybody who knows how these things are supposed to go, right? So anyway, I bought this ticket in cash. I buy a ticket for a plane that's leaving 10 minutes before it takes off. I'm buying the ticket for it, going on an international flight. Most importantly, I forget to make sure that they put Junior on my ticket. Because if they put Courtney Brown Sr., which is what it comes out, then they're going to run it through the computer even back then, and it's going to come up that it's my dad. And of course, my father, with his past reputation, and I think at the time he was still on paper, leaving the country would have been a violation of his uh, of his parole. So anyway, as I'm leaving from Miami on my way to the island, I had prior noticed at Miami International Airport three guys 
three white guys, one Hispanic guy, really eyeing me at the bar. I paid no attention to it. And uh, looking back on it again, like an intern, doing things that you got no business doing, I step outside Miami International, I smoke a joint, which was kind of my routine doing such assignments. And uh, after I smoke my joint, I try to be the last one on the plane. I get on the plane, and I see the same four guys who are watching me at the bar getting on the airplane. But instead of coming towards the passengers, they go into the pilot's room. I'm thinking to myself, that's kind of odd. About five minutes later, the pilot gets on the PA system. Ah, oh, passengers, excuse me, excuse me. We're going to have a slight delay in uh, taking off. Please be patient. We'll be right with you. And I'm like, uh, that ain't good either. Five minutes later, two agents, well now, I, well, now I know they were agents, but at the time, I see two guys go to the right. Another two guys start walking towards me. They stop at my seat, and they go, Courtney Brown? I say, yeah. And they go, grab your bags, DEA, come with us. Needless to say, uh, this is not the fun part of being an intern. To make a long story short, I go through the little ring and roll with the DEA. They call U.S. Customs. Uh, any of you are who are familiar with how U.S. Customs work, they're not really people that you play with at an international airport. The people at Customs tell me that either I tell them what's in my luggage or they're going to take all my luggage. I think I had about 65, 70,000 bucks on me to go pay this bill. And uh, I hadn't done anything wrong. I had not broken any law. The problem was they thought I was my father. And it took them about an hour after interrogations to figure out that I was not my father and that I had actually not broken any law. Had I been my father, I would have been violating my parole leaving the country. But I, wasn't, I am not my father. And they just had effed up, you know? So problem is, though, by the time they figure out that this has been a honest mistake or a dishonest mistake, they've already gone through my luggage and they found the money. You know, and for those who think that police corruption, those things are just a joke, I'm here to tell you it's not. Uh, you know, they each took 5,000, each agent took $5,000 for me. They gave me back the rest of the money. They told me, welcome to Miami Vice, and told me to get the fuck out their office and tell your parents, to, uh, tell your dad we know what he's up to. So um, it was a very interesting internship in uh, uh, college years. I got a real chance to see how the real world works. You know, one of the things I think that makes this story unique when you play out the whole thing, which obviously we don't have enough time, so you're going to have to, you guys have to check back with us for part two, is uh, the transitioning away from the street life into legitimate business. And, uh, you know, it's really the story, if you look back in the 20s, most Jewish, you know, in the 20s, Jewish Americans were related or associated with organized crime, or in the 30s, Italians were associated with organized crime. Well, now in 2011, when you think of Jewish Americans, you think of international finance or banking or those kind of things. And that's because they were able to transition themselves through education and some other things into legitimate, taxpaying, prosperous American citizens. So that was always our goal also. You know, uh, we never wanted to be a family forever. My father surely didn't want us to be a family that forever was involved in um, you know, a life of crime. So in 1983, I had already been working. Um, and you know, the one thing my parents, I guess, looking back, I really appreciate it. They always made me get a job, not because I needed the money. They were giving me plenty of money, and we had plenty of money laying around. But they wanted me to have a work ethic. And in the course of my living in New York and going to school, I ended up getting a job at, at The Gap, actually, a job in management. So I'm running one of the biggest Gap stores in the world. Uh, down in West Village, uh, 6th Avenue and uh, 4th Street. I'm, uh, I'm working at the flagship store on 34th Street across the street from Macy's. And I'm getting a chance to see how the real retail world works. And uh, one day, a buddy of mine tells me about this, uh, new lo this new location they got up in Harlem called the Mart 125 across the street from the Apollo Theater. He's telling me it's a place for uh, small black businessmen to open up and incubate businesses. And to be honest, we were sitting around drinking, getting high. And um, I'm like, really? I should open up a store. I'm tired of working for people. I've been selling clothes for other people for you know, five, 10 years now. And um, you know, sometimes bad things can lead to good things. Because due to the activities that my father was involved in, when I needed some seed money, I was able to get it. I mean, I don't know. Most people you know, hear about banks loaning people money or 
um, governments, small business loans. Well, that's, that's really fantasy. I've been all around the world and all around the country, and most people who start their businesses started from the money they save or family or relatives giving them their money to get started. In this case, I asked my father for some money to start a store in Harlem. I was fortunate enough that he had the resources, and he did, and um, it allowed me to live what I call the poor man puffy lifestyle. You know, I'm a, I'm a 27 year old African American guy, store across the street from the Apollo. First guy to bring Coogee sweaters to New York. At the time, uh, there was three stores in New York you could get a Coogee sweater Macy's, Bloomingdale's, and my shop up in Harlem. African Nights. Um, we had, I was doing a little importing of fabrics also um, back and forth from Africa at the time. It was, but my lifestyle, I made a lot of money at the store, but um, I was living the um, early rap star life. A lot of drugs, a lot of girls, a lot of escorts, a lot of limo rides. And uh, from that venture, even though I made a lot of money, I spent the vast majority of that money. But, the, you know, the funny thing is, or not the funny thing, the fortunate thing is, I was actually able to go back to my family again and get some more money to... Uh, to keep my business going. But I got a chance to, you know, go to the nightclubs at a time when Mike Tyson, I, you know, I partied at nightclubs with Mike Tyson, Naomi Campbell, Prince. Uh, these later clothing ventures allowed me to do business with Russell Simmons, Eve, uh, Dame Dash, George Clinton. So, you know, the, the path that these events of when I was a kid, the journey that they took me on and some of the people they've allowed me to meet, you know, really makes it a kind of unique, interesting story. And, <laughs> yeah, um, the funny how things can happen. Now, me and my buddy are, you know, we're young. Now I'm 27 years old, relatively young. And uh, we're looking through one of these, uh, I think it was a Village Voice. And in New York, in the back of these kind of uh, local magazines, they have these advertisements for girls. And we make a friendly little bet because at this time, to be honest, I had never, I had heard of an escort, but I didn't really know exactly what it was. I knew what a prostitute was, but I wasn't really aware of what, a, uh, what an escort was. And me and my buddy make a bet that, um, do these escorts actually perform sexual favors for money or is this just like an escort, you know, like a, a woman who will go to a, a fancy affair with you and be on your arm? And I'm looking, I'm like, at $125 an hour, buddy, they got to be doing more than just taking, walking you into a nightclub. Anyway, we made a bet, and it was the most expensive bet I ever won because we figured out that you could actually, in New York City, order women on an American Express card and have them come to your place and, and, and have a party with you and entertain you and, and take care of you. Problem was for my father was that the credit card I had at the time was his American Express card. And in the midst of one of those months of a lot of champagne, a lot of limos, and a lot of escorts, I think I blew like 10,000 bucks on his American Express card. And I'm back in Detroit a few months later and he looks at his American Express and he's like, you know, how the fuck do you spend 10,000 bucks on broads in one month? And uh, needless to say, I never used his American Express card after that again. 